Welcome to the first CCI webinar series, Multidisciplinary Cancer Care at Treatment Continuum. We are now on the third week of our webinar series. For the past two weeks, we had fortunate to have the following lectures from esteemed speakers, Dr. Fu Qian Fong and Dr. Dean Ko, as well as Dr. Chin Hua of National University, Singapore. This week, we have our luck topic, Early Palliative Care for Advanced Cancer, When and How. To introduce our speaker, may I introduce to you our moderator. Our moderator for today is Dr. Francis Jason Villegas. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and pain management consultant in palliative medicine at Cebu Cancer Institute. He graduated at Cebu Institute of Medicine had his residency in anesthesiology and fellowship in pain management at the University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital. He proceeded to have his clinical fellowship in palliative medicine at the National Cancer Center in Singapore. He is a former board of director at the Philippine Society of Anesthesiology. He is presently practicing here in Perpetual Sucor Hospital, as well as in various institutions in the city. Friends, let us welcome Dr. Francis Jason Villegas. Good afternoon, everyone. Our speaker is a specialist in internal medicine and palliative medicine. She heads the Division of Palliative Care at the National University Cancer Institute, Singapore. She is an assistant professor, clinical Educator Track, Department of Medicine, National University of Singapore, Yonggu Lin School of Medicine. He is also an undergraduate medical education director for palliative medicine of the same institution. She obtained her medical training in Singapore, England, and Australia, and was medical director and CEO of Dover Park Hospice before joining the National University Cancer Institute of Singapore in 2008, where she is now senior consultant and head of the Division of Palliative Care. She heads the multidisciplinary palliative service of the National University Hospital, which provides a consultative shared care service to patients, regardless of age, diagnosis, or discipline, even including pediatrics. Her other appointments include Chair of the Palliative Medicine Subspecialty Training Committee, Co-Chair of the Supportive and Palliative Care Subcommittee of the National Advisory Committee on Cancer Care. She is a member of the National Advanced Care Planning Steering Committee. Her interests include the interface between palliative care and oncology clinical decision-making and ethical issues at the end of life, spirituality in healthcare, and palliative care education at all levels. At Trivia, before I introduce her, today is World Hospice Day, October 10 of 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, let us hear from Dr. Noreen Chan. Good day, everyone and warm greetings from Singapore. My name is Dr. Noreen Chan, and I'm very happy to be speaking to you today on the topic of early palliative care for advanced cancer. Uh, very much thanks to the kind... Good day, everyone, and warm greetings from Singapore. My name is Dr. Noreen Chan, and I'm very happy today to be given the opportunity to share with you about early palliative care for advanced cancer. Thank you to the organizers for the kind invitation. I hope that my experience has something of use to you, and I would be very happy to answer your questions at the end. First, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. But I will say right now that I do not have all the answers. In fact, I may generate even more questions, and I apologize for that in advance. 
a little bit by way of introduction to myself and where I work. So I work at the National University Hospital, which is one of Singapore's teaching hospitals. It's about 1,000 beds and uh, is merged with our medical school as a cluster that is called NUHS. The Division of Palliative Care is actually sited within the National University Cancer Institute, but we serve the entire hospital regardless of age or diagnosis, including pediatrics. That said, about 75 to 80% of our patients have a cancer diagnosis. The outline of my talk will be as follows. There's quite a lot to cover, so I will not be able to go into any one topic in great detail, but really give a, a, a general overview and to finish with some of my own thoughts. If I had given this talk 10 years ago, I would have had to spend a substantial amount of time arguing the case for integrating palliative care into oncologic care. But really, since the publication of Jennifer Tamel's paper, and rightly so it is called a groundbreaking paper, it is increasingly difficult to ignore the evidence that palliative care given early alongside routine oncologic care does benefit not only cancer patients, but their caregivers. Because of that, all the major professional oncologic bodies now recommend to integrate palliative care with oncologic care, not perhaps for all patients, but for those with the greatest needs that is those who present with advanced cancer or a high symptom burden. The ESCO practice guideline, in fact, suggests that referral of patients to interdisciplinary palliative care teams is optimal. But this is the ideal. In reality, we don't even have enough dedicated palliative care clinicians. By that, I mean doctors, nurses, and allied health, let alone whole teams. And the reality also is there will probably never be enough specialists to see every single patient and every single family who needs palliative care. I like this quote from my colleague, Dr. Chong Po Heng. He's the head of HCA Hospice Care, which is Singapore's largest home care service. And what he says is true. There won't be enough of us but neither should it be only our job to look after everyone who is dying. This is something that involves the whole of society. I'd like to illustrate this with my own experience. This is a photograph from a few years ago of the Department of Hematology Oncology. Now, I'm sure you have heard of this game called Where's Wally, where uh, the premise is that you are supposed to pick Wally out from a crowd of people. Let us play a similar game. Where's the palliative doctor? Can you see me in and amongst this whole crowd of doctors? Actually, there I am in blue behind Professor John Wong. And this is my daily reality. I am far outnumbered by the number of oncologists and hematologists. And even though there are other services in other parts of Singapore with many more doctors than my hospital, the truth is, the resources are unable to keep up with the need. Therefore, if we don't have enough palliative care specialists to meet all of the need, what should we do? Well, the natural conclusion would be, well, then the non-specialists need to take on some of this load. But how do we do this? Before I suggest how we might do this, I would like to introduce to you the concept of the palliative approach. This is not a new concept, but I think it bears some explanation. There are various ways to define the palliative care approach, but I like this one. It says that Palliative care approach is really about centering the, the care around the needs of the patient and family. And the focus of this approach is one that optimizes quality of life throughout the disease journey. 
it does not mean that you have to give up disease-directed care, but it means that quality of life takes a very important role. The core components of the palliative care approach are firstly, open and sensitive communication. And why? Because we need to understand the goals, preferences and wishes of the patient and family. It is only when we understand goals, preferences and wishes that the care and treatment can be aligned and the other areas of focus should be pain and symptom control, good psychosocial and spiritual support, and grief and bereavement care. So now that I have explained to you what the palliative approach is, who needs to know what? Now, just as with a, a common condition like hypertension, we know that there are cases that are quite straightforward, that anyone even a newly graduated doctor can manage, and there are cases that are complex that require the input of an expert. So it is with palliative care. If we were to tier palliative care into three levels, at the top of this pyramid, the smallest area would be someone like myself. I'm a specialist, considered a domain expert, and I see patients and families with life-limiting illnesses all the time. This is my job. However, in the next level, what we call the generalists, these are doctors and nurses and other healthcare providers who frequently see patients and families with life-limiting illness and who frequently may have palliative needs. So this would be disciplines like oncology, heart failure, progressive neuromuscular illnesses, progressive respiratory illnesses, a large proportion of these patients will, despite all that we do, get sicker and die. And their doctors will need to have some skills to actually provide basic palliative care. But even if we agreed that all oncologists should know some basic palliative care, well, what would they look like? What are the elements that are important. Uh, and as uh, Diane Meyer has said, what is in the palliative care syringe that we could inject in you know, to improve the quality of life of the patient? That is something that we are still working on. But from the publication that was led by Jacqueline Jung and her co-workers, it was interesting, they did a qualitative study looking at the interactions between the palliative care workers and patients. And they found that in the initial visits, the palliative care clinicians, it wasn't just doctors, but also nurses, what they focused on was really relationship building and symptom management, really checking in with patients what they understood or wanted to understand about their prognosis and their disease. When things got more advanced, both the palliative care and oncologic teams did talk about end of life, although the focus was then a little bit different. The oncologists were probably more disease focused. They would look at the scans, they would talk about the tumor markers, whereas the palliative care teams tended to focus more on the coping, the reality of living with advanced illness. So in essence, I see this as that the palliative care specialists were actually having a complementary role. So if we were to ask ourselves what is required in palliative care for oncologic patients, now these are the suggested skill sets. Definitely pain management has to be a priority. Pain is common. And it is something that we can't wait for any one particular person to address it. But indeed, everybody who sees a cancer patient needs to be able to recognize and at least begin management for pain. Cancer and the treatment of cancer can also cause a lot of symptoms. So other kinds of symptom management should be done. Uh, for example, breathlessness, nausea, vomiting, constipation, psychologic problems such as anxiety and depression. Communication is a key part of any healthcare provision, and, and especially so in oncology, where there's often a lot of bad news to be broken, 
and the information can sometimes be complex. A psychosocial assessment is also important because the impact of cancer isn't just physical. And because we, the reality is that many of our patients will, despite everything that we do for them, they will deteriorate and they will die. To be able to provide good care in the last hours or days of life is also crucial. And of course, we can't be the only ones doing the work and we need to be able to bring in and work with other care providers, including community-based care providers. So if we all agree that integration is necessary and that what the common skill sets could be, what would this look like? What would palliative care look like when inserted into oncologic care? The truth is, there's no one best approach. There's no one right way. It really depends on where you work, what the resources are. There are many examples. The most common model is what we would call oncologist triggered. So the oncologist would decide when and how is the best time to refer to palliative care. For others, it may be a time-based. For example, you know, if uh, the oncologist felt that the patient had a median survival of one year or less, that might be a good time to refer. There are other centers that take a needs-based or uh, what we call a patient-reported uh, outcome measure-based. For example, if by doing the distress thermometer, it hits a certain threshold, uh, then they would activate palliative care. Or lastly, it could be protocol-driven. So any patient, for example, who is enrolling into a phase one trial or to experimental therapy would also get a palliative care referral. I must stress again, there is no one best approach. And the most common one is still probably when the oncologist decide it is the right time. Before I suggest to you uh, what a 21st century approach might look like, why don't we go back and look and see how palliative care has evolved since its early days in the 1960s. So when palliative care was first introduced and was started growing up, especially around cancer care, it was very much uh, either or. So the patient would receive cancer treatment up until the time when none was available anymore or the patient himself decided that he did not want any more cancer treatment, then they would refer to palliative care. So they would just be either or, not both together. From about the 1980s and, and still to the current day, there was greater recognition that referring earlier could be of benefit and it was possible to have both disease-directed therapy and palliative cancer care at the same time. Uh, there's no, no firm agreement on when it might be the right time. Usually, again, it tends to be dependent on the oncologist's choice or if the patient had a lot of symptoms, but this is probably the most common model that practices nowadays. The patient may or may not be still receiving cancer-directed therapy when the referral to palliative care is made. What I'd like to tell you about now is something that is not new. It, it's been around for at least five or six years, and it is called the bow time model of palliative care. Uh, you can see from this illustration why it is called the bow time model, and it consists of two overlapping triangles, uh, which I will describe the concept in the next couple of slides. What happens in this bow time model is that disease management or cancer-directed therapy can go hand in hand with palliative care. Let us imagine this blue triangle as disease management. So in disease management, there is cancer-directed therapy from a variety of modalities added to traditional cancer-supportive care. 
Now, this triangle could lead to cure or prolonged disease control and survivorship, or it could lead to deterioration, dying, finally death. But whatever it is, just take it that across when we move in time from left to right, the disease-directed therapy will continue. We'll try our best to keep the cancer at bay. Now, how does palliative care fit into this model? Think about this other triangle going the other direction. So in palliative care, there is a very strong focus on pain and symptom management, psychosocial, emotional, and spiritual support. But in addition, palliative care is also able to add a, a, a form of supportive therapy through, for example, nutrition, rehabilitation, you know, uh, features like that. But at the same time, palliative care, through its domain expertise, does have a particular skill in end-of-life care and in working with models of care such as hospice. But it doesn't mean that palliative care is only for patients who are dying. Palliative care also has a role in cancer survivorship. So when we put these two triangles overlapping, what do we get? We actually get a model of care that aims to let the patient live as well as possible for as long as possible. So it's really about the best of both worlds rather than having to choose. All this should be founded on the patient's goals combined with the expertise of the oncologic and palliative teams to come up with a model of care and treatment that best suits the particular patient and the particular family. So let me now share with you a couple of examples from my own experience about how palliative care could help to improve the quality of life of patients. So the first example is that of cancer survivorship. The patient in question was a 60-year-old man who had a long history living with cancer of the colon. He had had chemotherapy and actually three major surgeries, including a Whipple's procedure for pancreatic met. He was now on six to 12 monthly follow-up, but his oncologist was very concerned because the patient kept on losing weight, even though the CEA level was flat, and the CT scan seemed clear, except for a non-specific nodule in the left lower lung, but it wasn't getting bigger at all. So what the oncologist did was to refer the patient to myself. He said, with exactly, he said, I don't know what's going on with this man, but he's looking so ill that even if he had cancer, I wouldn't be able to do anything for him. So the patient did come to my clinic, and actually he did look very frail. He looked exactly like a cancer patient because he was so cachectic. If you see here on, in this illustration, he only weighed 35 kilograms when he came to me. And he arrived in a wheelchair. He was pale, he was balding, his hair was coming off in patches over his head. The skin was dry and flaky. So what I did was I put all my assumptions aside and did a screening set of blood tests. And lo and behold, he was anemic, he had hyperglycemia, and had multiple deficiencies. So actually what was happening was that he was suffering from the effects of aggressive cancer treatment. He had pancreatic insufficiency, including now diabetes. He had osteopenia, he was severely malnourished and he was very badly deconditioned. This was not as a result of cancer itself, but as a result of successful cancer treatment. So what happened? Well, I referred him to endocrine for another opinion because I, uh, I suspected he needed insulin and true enough, he did. 
Uh, I sent him to the nutritionist for diet advice and added on vitamins, mineral supplements, got him into physiotherapy, and over the next number of months, his condition stabilized and improved. He actually gained weight and started walking. As you can see here, a number of months later, his weight had gone up from the original 35 kilograms to about 52 kilograms. And we turned then into the, the focus to chronic disease management because he still needed care from the effects of his cancer treatment. He died about three years later from complications related to severe pneumonia. But this illustrates to you that curing a person of cancer is not the end of the journey. And sometimes you need another pair of eyes to be able to appreciate that the patient has other problems that need attention too. The second case example is of a patient with advanced active cancer, and I call this fighting the good fight. The patient in question was a 68-year-old man, uh, originally from America, but now living in a neighboring country and diagnosed with unresectable cholangeal carcinoma. He sought treatment initially in the country where he was living, with the insertion of PTC, with chemotherapy, and even had RFA of a lung lesion. On disease progression, he flew into our country, but he went to another center first, where he received treatment to a localized liver lesion and had more treatment then entered the trial. During the time when he was under that cancer center, he started to develop pain, and so he was started on analgesics, firstly tramadol, and then later on switched to Tajin. When his disease progressed again, he was referred to our center for another trial. But when he turned up to the clinic, he was so symptomatic that he required admission for symptom management, and so that's how he was referred to my service. So what were the issues when we saw him? He had very bad pain despite taking a mix of opioids. So at the time when I saw him, he was actually taking a mix of three different kinds of opioids and yet not getting adequate pain relief. He also had a lot of opioid-related adverse effects. He was very sleepy, very constipated, feeling nauseated. Because of his symptoms, he could not sleep. He was feeling tired all the time. He was very dehydrated. There was also a need, at least from my perspective, to be able to clarify what he understood and what he wanted. I place particular emphasis on this whenever I see foreign patients, because if they have flown a long way to a foreign country to get treatment, what if something happens to them while they are in this foreign country? Do they want to fly back home? Where do they want to be? Because no, I'm, it is very difficult already to be stuck in a strange place far away from all your supports. Can you imagine if you are stuck in that strange place and you are dying? So I, I often do start conversations quite early about what if, what if things don't go well? Anyway, his story isn't finished yet, but I'll just tell you what happened next. So I had to readjust his medications and we were able to get good relief of his pain and other symptoms like constipation and nausea. But the main focus here was about a conversation. We spent a lot of time getting to know him and talking about many things, what he did, his life, how he ended up in where he ended up, what he wanted, what he did not want. He needed a little bit of medical intervention, but he got better and he was able to enter the trial. So two weeks later, he flew back in, um, and this time, you know, he had another set of problems. He was severely dehydrated from very bad mucositis and inability to eat. He was very fatigued, and all this was due to the trial drug. So he, he did need uh, admission for hydration and for correction of all the electrolyte problems. And and, uh, but the truth is, he did not regret 
he was happy that he had tried the, the, the trial medication even though it had had such severe effects and nearly killed him. To him, it was Im as important to try. Ironically, pain was not a problem this time. He was able to continue with his usual medications with no change. We continued to talk to him, but now the discussion was more about if you don't have cancer treatment now, what's going to happen? What are your goals? Now, he was very clear in his mind that he knew that his time was short. He wanted quality of life. And for him, quality of life was comfort to be in his own home. And home for him actually meant that neighboring country to have his family with him and to not to have things dragged out. And so we optimized his condition as much as we could and let him fly home with a supply of medications and with instructions for what to do if his condition were to deteriorate. Now he was uh, still keeping in touch by email with the oncologist. So I allowed the oncologist to continue to take the lead. But of course, the oncologist could always consult me uh, if she needed any advice. He lived on for another couple of months before he died. So where do I think the, that the specialist palliative service was able to help? Well, first of all, we worked very closely with the oncology team to understand this patient's goals. And we wanted to make sure that the treatment was aligned with his goals. We ensured that his symptom control was as good as it could be, including avoidance of trial prohibited drugs. So this is uh, something that some I need to take note of because if our patients are on particular trials, there are certain trials that prohibit certain kinds of opioids. So for example, for this particular patient, this trial that he was on prohibited the use of the fentanyl patch. There have been other patients that have been prohibited other trials, for example, that prohibited the use of methadone. And we need to be aware of this because we do not want to inadvertently, you know, uh, get the patient kicked off the trial. We did help to optimize the patient's chances of entering the trial, working together again with the oncology team. We ensured very clear communication between all the teams that were involved in his care. We helped the patient and family prepare for end of life. Now it's not as if people didn't do palliative care before the patient came to see me. Everyone had. They had provided good explanation. They had provided symptom control as much as they could. But when the patient's needs got to the level that his oncologist could not manage, that was where they needed someone like myself to come in and do what I call adding the extra layer of care. So I hope those two examples give you an illustration about how palliative care can add value to oncologic care. But finally, I would like to stress these few points. Early palliative care does not always mean specialist palliative care. The primary teams, be they the oncology or heart failure or renal or any team, can actually begin to provide basic palliative care. When we talk about early integration of palliative care, I feel it is about early identification of suffering and then begin to address that suffering. And addressing suffering and distress is really everyone's responsibility. But in order to do this successfully and sustainably, we need to build up generalist palliative care skills. If we are going to work together, each side needs to learn more about the work of the other. This means Oncology staff should learn about palliative care and palliative care staff need to learn about oncology. In our specialist palliative care training in Singapore, we rotate all our trainees through oncology. We see if that is really important for them to understand the, the doctors, nurses and other experts that they will be working with and who will be referring patients to them. It is very dangerous to only do one thing. 
because as the saying goes, if you are a hammer, the whole world is a nail. You can only see the world through your view. In order to really be providing good care for our patients, we need to learn more about what the other specialists are doing. Because if we do not, if you do not even know the hammer, you will never even see the nail. How can we do this? As I said, I don't have any answers. But one thing I do try to do within my hospital is to make information about palliative care very easily accessible. Now, one of the easiest way to do it is actually through our intranet. So this is a page from our hospital intranet which houses all the relevant palliative care information, practice tips, and policies. For example, here under practical palliative care tips, you will see a lot of information about use of, uh, use of opioids, how to manage pain and dyspnea, and even something called a terminal discharge guide. In Singapore, when we say terminal discharge, we actually mean to discharge the patient from hospital to go home to die, to spend the last hours or the last days at home. Now, I want to draw your attention to this particular last point here, which is called rapid IV opioid titration for pain or dyspnea crisis. Now, pain or dyspnea crisis is not common. It doesn't happen every day, but one of the places where it is likely to be encountered is in the emergency department. When patients turn up to the ED with severe pain or dyspnea that they can't manage at home. So that when you click on that link in our intranet, it actually brings you to our hospital emergency department guidelines. So this is an example where with some support and training, there are other departments that can develop their own particular skill sets to deal with palliative care situations that are quite unique to their setting. And so, in conclusion, I would like to remind everyone that despite the advances that we have made, about half of patients diagnosed with cancer will still die from cancer. Of course, they will have lived much longer and better because of advanced cancer treatment, but we cannot forget that they will still die. There are benefits of integrating palliative care into standard oncologic care as part of a comprehensive cancer care model. The reality is though, there will never be enough dedicated palliative care personnel, even in specialist cancer centers and hospitals. So in order to mitigate this, we must prepare everyone to get involved in patient's care. And palliative care specialists not only look after the patients, but need to support and teach and mentor everyone to care. We should still be concentrating on the more complex cases, but I must stress that at least I consider teaching and mentoring and support to be an integral part of my job. The more people we can prepare to look to do basic palliative care, the more assured patients can be that wherever they are, whichever discipline, whichever ward, whatever time, that they will be able to get some palliative care. I have drawn on these references to prepare for this talk, and you may find them useful. And with that, I thank you very, very much for your attention. I would be very happy to take questions now, and I look forward to your sharing. Thank you very much, Noreen. Thank you for accepting this invitation. And it's a very good thing that you reminded me that today is World Hospice Day. What a timely session to celebrate this day, World Hospice Day. So we have a question here, Noreen. Yep, I can hear right. you. Uh, um, I can't turn my video on, but never mind. It's okay. Anyway, we have a question. We have one yeah. attendee. Uh, there you go. I can see you now. We right. have one attendee from Manila. She's a medical oncologist. The question goes, 
how do you handle communicating prognosis for advanced cancer patients during this time of limited face-to-face -face interaction? I don't know how you handle it from there, but we have a problem. We do have a problem here in the Philippines. Uh, I, I think, uh, uh, what, what, thank you for that question. It's a very real and practical problem we all face. I like to say that um, there's never enough of anything except work. Uh, and but but before I answer that question, perhaps just let me share with you what uh, the evidence says that cancer patients want to know or do not want to know about prognosis. So from from a series of uh, systematic reviews, it uh, by my Australian colleagues, they have found that actually patients and families do want to know about their disease. They want to know whether it can be treated, and they do want to know about prognosis. How, and who do they want to know it from? They want to know it from a trusted health professional, but they do want to be able to negotiate the content and timing, which means they want to know, but you have to find out what they want to know, how they want to know it, and when they want to know. So yeah, these are the problems that we all face. I think that, uh, especially when you are going to deliver bad news, uh, it is like giving bitter medicine. Uh, you you do want to be able to give all the bitter medicine, but you and because you know that it's going to do some good, but you will not be able to. You have to dose it in a very individual way. For some people, you can give all the the medicine at one go. For others, you must have to give you you might have to give it in small aliquots. And uh, I would I would guess that in a busy setting, sometimes you may not be possible to do everything all at one shot, but really to layer it on bit by bit to. For, for example, that people need to understand that firstly, this is cancer, it is advanced, can't be cured. I think that message has to sink in before you can go on to talk about other things like um, that one day this is going to kill you. Uh, uh, and I think sometimes the pressure that the, my colleagues feel is that they feel they have to get everything done all at one go, which is not often not possible when you are delivering news of this nature. So it might have to be layered on. And it is also, um, I mean, the tips that I give my colleagues are also to give them ways of how they might find out from their patients and families how ready they are to receive the information uh, about how to ask clarifying questions and how to sort of give a warning shot before you actually uh, uh, drop the bomb, as it were. Uh, and I, I guess there's no one right way, but one of the advantages uh, that we have in working with our colleagues is that often uh, I'm an informal coach. They might come and tell me about a certain encounter that didn't go so well or something, and we can talk about it. And I say, well, maybe next time you, you might try saying it in this way or, or that way. But I, it, it is a common problem. Everyone is busy and there really isn't any time for anything. So I, I hope that that was at least, uh, I, I know I didn't answer it in the way that you might have hoped, but I hope that uh, it sort of set you thinking. All right. Going back, uh, there's another question in relation to that. So with the situation at hand, this pandemic, what I mean, what has changed specifically, if, if any, in the home care services? Are there specific measures that because the contact from the nurses to the patient themselves? Obviously, it is a problem here. That's why a lot of our cancer patients, initially when we had our a lockdown mandated by the government, they were afraid to go to. When we started opening our clinics, a lot of these cancer patients, failed to follow up with their doctors because of that fear. I want to know the situation there in Singapore. Okay, so in, in Singapore, we are fortunate in that um, we're a small and, as you know, very tightly governed country. And when uh, to the extent that if during, we had a lockdown, we called it a circuit breaker. Uh, and, you know, if you break the law in Singapore, there's no hesitation to, first of all, fine you. And then if you are still very recalcitrant, they will arrest you. Uh, our Infectious Diseases Act is draconian in, in many senses, but it does, it does mean that public safety comes first. 
But uh, our home care services did have a problem. Now, I, I don't do home care, but we were in close contact as a community and everybody was sharing information. There was a worry initially with the home care about how safe was it to go into the homes. So many home care services had to scramble and set up policies and procedures to, first of all, risk what we do, risk stratify. They, they actually had to find out ways of uh, trying to work out if it would be safe to visit a patient at home. Uh, many of them stopped taking new cases unless it could be proved that these uh, cases from the hospital were COVID-free or COVID-safe. And then when they visited the home, they had to cut down on the number of visits and they had to wear PPE. So we are, we are lucky in, in Singapore that we don't have a PPE shortage, that we have widespread testing. Uh, and in fact, uh, now we cannot transfer patients to nursing homes or hospices or community hospitals without negative COVID swaps. So that is now mandated. And then what happened for some of our inpatient hospices is that they also applied to the government and were given permission uh, and training to do COVID swaps. So now what happens is that if a patient is admitted from home into an inpatient hospice or palliative care unit, they will be isolated initially and then swapped. And then only if they're cleared, they, uh, they can go into a general ward. So we are somewhat more fortunate. But uh, even today, many of our home care services are still being done in PPE unless the patient is uh, really considered to be quite safe. Uh, there was exactly. also a lot of telemedicine. So in the initial phase as well, whatever cases that were, could be managed by telemedicine were being done uh, electro uh, by telemedicine. Exactly. So that's what we wanted to hear. So when we opened clinics here, especially for the oncologists, we had to sort of make a campaign that we were making the necessary measures, like in our clinics, we put up acrylic glasses all the way up to the ceiling. And we limited patients. We created scheduling for visits. So they have to call in before they come in. And then each patient that was seen by, by the, the attending in the clinics, before the next patient comes in, we had to do a lot of disinfection. So we try to simulate a negative pressure environment by opening windows uh, in, and all those measures that necessary. Even the, for ourselves, we we wear, we wore PPE, and, including the staff in the clinic, just to assure these patients. So the next, we have a next question. How do you handle cases when the family does not want the patient to know the diagnosis that the patient is asking his diagnosis, especially with close family ties. Uh, so again, a common situation, uh, maybe a bit less common now in Singapore, but it's still very common among the elderly, especially. Uh, so I, I, the, the way I approach it is I always remember there are, first of all, two parties. There's the patient and there's the family. And I also try to bear in mind that the family is doing this not out of spite or malice, but they are doing this out of love. And we have to appreciate that. So they're not, they're not bad people and they're not villains, which is, you know, it, we, might, we might be tempted to think that they are being very bad and unfair, but we must remember that sometimes when you love someone, it sort of comes out in a strange way. So uh, I always will try to engage the family to under the, understand their perspective and to talk to, let hear out their fears. And also, uh, because only when you listen to, to someone and they believe you understand them and are willing to accept their opinions, they won't accept yours. So we have to build a rapport. They need to trust that I will listen to them objectively so that I can tell them the pros and cons of telling versus not telling the truth. Every now and then, you're going to come to a, a situation where you realize when the family tell you that it's actually not a good idea to tell the patient, perhaps not in the example that was raised in the question, but I have had one case before where it, uh, it turned out that this patient has a, a, a great fear of death and dying to the extent that when his closest friend died, he refused to attend the funeral or if he sees that there's a funeral where he will actually cross the road and go to the other side. So he, he had such a morbid fear that then we realized 
you know, that, that we shouldn't tell him because uh, it would really affect him psychologically. So after we talk to the family, though, it's a, it's a process of negotiation. We talk about the pros and cons. Now, if there are pressing factors that the patient does need to know, for example, or procedures that require consent and all that, then we push a little harder. But uh, if not, we negotiate about when and how it might be good to tell, uh, how they want to pace it. Sometimes I coach family members how to tell. And sometimes we also negotiate about what if I tell? You can all be there as a family. If the patient doesn't want to know, they will give me a lot of signals and I will not hit them on the head with the truth stick. You know, but, but if they want to know, like I said, it is bitter medicine. Uh, you know, we, I, I can help you to dose it, but uh, the patient will let us know how much of the medicine he or she wants to take at any point in time. So I find that you, it takes a little bit of negotiation and the building of trust. But if you manage that, uh, it can go quite well. It'll go slowly, but eventually it, it will happen. Okay, there's another dilemma here. So the question goes, is it ethical that if the oncologist did not disclose the prognosis to a relative, if asked by the relative, can you as one attending doctor tell the truth to the patient or relative? Um, well, okay, so again, in this situation, it, I think it would depend on uh, you know, sometimes with your local work culture about how people feel and, and who has ownership. Uh, in, in certain work cultures, uh, if, if there's a primary doctor who has ownership, uh, he or she might be quite territorial, uh, including with territorial about information. So, uh, but I think Jason knows me very well from before. Uh, I, I'm, not very, I'm not one to respect certain boundaries. And if you refer to me and I, you know, if people want to know, I'll tell them. Yeah. Yeah. But the way that I would approach this, it perhaps a bit more diplomatically is to, uh, to ask the relative what they've been told, uh, what they understand. And if I don't feel comfortable to reveal the whole thing, I might drop hints that I'll give the warning shot that it's not very good news. Or if uh, what I sometimes do when I talk about prognosis, when uh, you know, uh, my colleagues are often um, hesitant to talk about prognosis because they say, I don't know if I'll get it right. I, I sometimes may not mention the, the time that I think that the patient has, but I might say things like, uh, you know, when there, there are certain things that may start to happen as your loved one uh, gets weaker, how do we know that the end is coming? You, you'll find that last time they can walk very well, and then you'll find that they're very tired and they're spending more time in a chair. And then from a chair, they're spending more time in a bed. They are eating less. And these are all signs that the body is getting weaker and that perhaps time might be short. So you're not, you're not saying how much time they have left. You're actually educating them on how to recognize when time is getting shorter. So by the time our patients start to experience functional decline, poor appetite and weight loss, we are reliably looking at a few weeks to a few months. But you, you may not, depending on the patient, you may not want to tell, be so upfront about it. You may want to just uh, educate them first on the signs and then see, see, how they want to know. And again, it's negotiating, uh, you know, if they want to know more, then we let them know. Uh, and then at the same time, like I said, being mindful of the prior relationship that the primary specialist has with the patient and trying not to take over that because we, we still try to be as collegial as possible. I, I do tell my team I, and I ask them, I say, who's your customer? Because we work on a consult basis, right? I say, who's your customer? They all, they all say, oh, the patient. I say, nope. I said, the patient is, the patient wouldn't be your customer if the referring specialist didn't think you could help. So actually, our, um, I'm always reminded that our primary customer is actually the specialist who refers. And if we didn't do a good job, we would get no referrals. Exactly. I can share the sentiment from where the question was coming from. 
especially disclosing it to a relative rather than a patient at times. Because a lot of the situations here, patients who receive treatment are being sponsored by a relative. So sometimes they feel they are entitled to the, to the truth or the prognosis in itself. So a next question would come in. So there are two questions from this particular person. How often do you encounter pediatric qualitative cases? That's number one. Number two, how does disclosure take place, especially when the family does not want to disclose? I guess it was related. Ah, it okay. So, uh, yes, I do see pediatric uh, palliative care. Uh, not so much recently because it, it's been quite busy. Uh, uh, but, uh, yes, I do see pediatric palliative care all the way from uh, little kiddos to adolescents. So, again, it's quite common that families try to uh, keep the diagnosis either completely or partially. Now, but I think nowadays when kids are really smart, and it's difficult to keep the whole truth from them because even, you know, even eight-year-olds have smartphones nowadays and can Google. Exactly. Yeah, I, I'm reminded of um, a little boy called Ryan. Ryan, I think, was around 12 or 13 when I first encountered him. And Ryan found out about his leukemia. Uh, his parents only told him that he had bad blood or something. And he found out about his leukemia because he overheard the nurses. He overheard the nurse's passing report. And this is a clever boy. He put two and two together. And he did some checking on his Google. And then one day he turned around to his mother and said, why didn't you tell me I had leukemia? <laughs> so it's, it's a bit hard to hide things from children. Uh, and, and again, it's a process of negotiation. I, I often advise my oncologists, and, many, and some of them are really good at this, say that, from up front, they set the rules of engagement. They engage the young, they engage the child, or especially the young person. For, for adolescents, it's really important. Up front, they find out what they want to know, how active they want to be in the decision making. And if you start off like that, it's, it's much easier to carry on like that. Uh, I would say that from the age of about six onwards, uh, children certainly are able to have some understanding about what's going on. They may not understand all the whole of the terms, but they, they, they know they're sick. Um, and they know that mom and dad are really worried about them being sick. And they know that they have to be in hospital and have surgery and things like that. And um, it's amazing what they can pick up. I've got a, a little, I think he's five, he's almost five, uh, with a rhabdomyosarcoma. And, you know, it, it, sometimes he has bleeding and he will actually ask the nurses, what is my, what is my HB today? Because he hears the nurses talking about HB. He hears the nurses hanging blood and things like that. And sometimes he sees the blood and he gets very solemn and he, he looks worried. Or he sees mom uh, 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 trying not to cry in the corner and things like that. So he's smart enough not to go and ask a lot, but he will ask the nurses a little technical questions. So he will say, how come you're hanging the blood like this today when yesterday it wasn't like this? <laughs> uh, so um, it, uh, uh, negotiation aside, I think we, we need to recognize that children see and hear more than we give them credit for. So there's another one. This is pretty interesting. And I guess we all go through it. May I know how palliative care specialists such as you are, de-stress or cope with the difficult cases? Oh, uh, yeah, again, a common question. Uh, medical students ask me about this a lot. Uh, so again, what, yeah, I, there, there was a study that was done about six, seven years ago amongst the palliative care community looking at levels of, of stress and burnout. And, the le and it, about 30% of doctors and nurses would meet criteria for burnout. Uh, but you, you might consider that high, but actually that's still lower than many other professions. And when they looked at and they asked what helped, there are a few factors. There are what I would call organizational factors, system factors, and team factors, uh, personal factors. So the, your, your organization does have a part to play in the, you know, how it assigns your work, your hours, whether it has a, a time for you to uh, enough time for you to rest, avenues for you to de-stress or talk to someone if you need help. Within the team as well, I think it's really important. The, because in palliative care, we do work as a team. Nobody ever carries a burden alone. 
And if there are very difficult cases, we do take extra care during our weekly team meetings to talk about it, to de-stress, etc. And for very, very bad cases, we sometimes will arrange for debriefs for the ward teams or for the disciplines. So these are all sort of system and organization factors. In personal factors, again, it, it is quite individual. Everybody has their own way. Uh, the, the principle is, is that all this work, and it doesn't matter what you do, perhaps it's more obvious in palliative care and it's more allowed in palliative care, but I would say that every single discipline uh, feels this. It drains you. So if you are drained, you must find a way to replenish yourself. There are many ways to replenish and everybody has their own preferred method. Some people prefer exercise, you know, others will turn to mother nature or their faith or uh, reflective practices such as meditation, journaling, etc., yoga. It, it, it probably doesn't matter what you do as long as you do it. That, that would be my advice. The, I, I think this whole COVID situation has really put uh, mental health issues on the map, not just for individuals, but very much for healthcare professionals. And, and although you know, we still like to believe that we are strong and unbreakable, it's also important to realize that we, you know, we're, we are still human and we do need to take time out to, uh, to look after ourselves so that we can look, up, look after our patients better. Exactly. I think I remember very well when you took a leave during my training, you brought me and LMA to Malacca to have those rice balls and introduce us to the culture of the Peranakan. So thank you very much. So another question is, how do you best palliate or address air hunger in a patient with advanced lung involvement who gave advanced directive of no intubation, no mechanical ventilator? Uh, by air hunger, I'm assuming you mean uh, very severe dyspnea? Dyspnea. Uh, okay, so, uh, well, this, this has been a very common concern, uh, especially in COVID times for patients who were dying of COVID, very breathless, often very agitated. We still turn to uh, uh, opioids, plus minus benzodiazepines. There is evidence, there's good evidence for their, uh, their benefit. And, and when used carefully, uh, in a stepwise manner, there is very little risk to the patient itself. Uh, and I, but I find that often there is a reluctance to use opioids and there's a reluctance to layer benzodiazepines on top of opioids, probably because of this fear that you will somehow depress the respiration. But in my experience, it you know, I, I really don't see it. It's different if you're looking after somebody with a, a neuromuscular problem such as maybe ALS or something like that. But by and large, most patients are fine. Correct. And there is one more thing that I also do need to mention that very often these patients who are hypoxic uh, or uh, elderly, they, they are often delirious as well. Delirious, agitated, we need to treat that. If you don't treat the delirium, then you will never be able to control this near because people who are delirious and agitated will try yeah. to move and struggle. They'll get more breathless. And when they get more breathless, they'll Correct. get more frightened and anxious. So each one makes the other one worse. So I would say learn how to use opioids, morphine or fentanyl, plus minus a benzodiazepine or the dazlam, and always remember to treat delirium. I completely agree with you. I do that a lot in my practice whenever I'm called into. So I like the fact that you, you market palliative care in Singapore well, especially the, with the advancement of technology. And I can see that you have marketed it well because apparently you have a shortage of manpower. Here in our setup, uh, there is, it's sort of stigmatized. Talking about death in itself somehow is taboo at some point, but slowly it's starting to open up. And again, oncologists have a big role. Like you said, in most cases, oncologists triggered referral to palliative care would be the gateway to such application of the service. The bow tie model is excellent because slowly we are introducing it from the onset. 
want to diagnose this. A tiered responsibility is one way of reducing the burden. And what I envision specifically here in Cebu City, we do lack manpower, nurses, even the administration. Of course, talking about economics, whenever they open up a service, they would like to talk about ROI. Probably initially we can open up skill set training for certain healthcare workers that can that we can send out to for home care services and even involve the family members who can take care of their own. Palliative emergencies might that's a good area of expertise that needs to be addressed too, because there are some of those patients who, who decide to die at home, but however if they're like opioid titration uh, for pain in, on dyspnea crisis. And the terminal discharge protocol that you do for patients who are graduated from the hospital into their homes is a very good idea also because some of them tend to spend so much of their, so much money in the hospital rather than if they have decided so that nothing aggressive has to be done they can do it at home. Yeah, I, I think, uh, interestingly enough, during COVID, uh, during circuit breaker and after when the restrictions were still uh, in place, actually referrals to hospice home care increased by 15 to 20% because people realized that they couldn't visit their dying relatives in hospital. They were being very uh, fiercely restricted so they said, let's discharge them and bring them home so that families can come around and spend time uh, in those last days or in those last hours. So that was an unintended benefit of raising awareness of hospice, uh, of community-based hospice services. And in, it, we, although I think that awareness of palliative care in Singapore is a lot better now compared to say 20 years ago, we still struggle a lot. You know, just last week, one of my hematology colleagues was wanting to refer a patient to me. And she spoke to the patient's daughter and the daughter said, well, she didn't, she emailed her. And the daughter said, oh, no, I don't think my father's ready for palliative care yet. But uh, so we're always going to encounter these kinds of things. And I'm, I'm not unrealistic. People don't want to hear bad stuff. They don't want to hear that they've got cancer. They don't want to hear that the cancer's advanced. They don't want to hear that, that there isn't any more effective cancer treatment. We're always going to have to deal with that. But I, I don't think it means that we run away from the. I think we have to think about ways about how we can, um, you know, how we can integrate, how we can be of use. Because my, my belief is, you know, everybody's going to die, but what you want is to live well for as long as you've got, because the dying part, that, that takes care of itself. It's exactly. the living part that's the struggle. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I completely agree. So unless we face the finitude of our life, we will never be prepared for death, be it ours and for a loved one. So Noreen, thank you very much for this discussion and for this session, and thank you for accepting our invitation. I guess this has been a very fruitful afternoon for us. What a way to celebrate World Hospice Day. Thank you for reminding. That's Very right. timely too. <laughs> and it's 10, 10, 20. Uh, well, <laughs> there's still time to go and do your online shopping. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think people are hurrying up for that too. So anyway, thank you again, Noreen. You're very welcome. And uh, thank you to everyone. Hope to hear from you soon. Yeah, thank you to everyone for spending your Saturday afternoon coming to listen. I, I hope that you found this to be useful and interesting. And I guess if there are any other further questions, uh, I'm, I'm sure either uh, you know, Jason or Ellie May will let me know. But thank you very much for your very kind invitation. All the best to all of you. Take care. All the best to you and take care, Marie. Thank you, Noreen. Thank you very much. We cannot thank you enough, but this has been a wonderful presentation and interaction. We will be emailing you should there be further questions. But you know, we're coming to a close of our third webinar for the first of a series of webinars from the Cancer Institute 
here at Perpetual Soccer Hospital. And I'd like to remind all the attendees that we will have the last and fourth webinar next, um, next Saturday, that is October 17. And the title of that webinar will be Uncertainty Upon Uncertainty Psychosocial Support for Cancer and COVID-19 for healthcare providers. So all healthcare providers and even our patients are welcome to, to join in. That will be by Mr. Rigel Tan, a psychiatry nurse practitioner all the way from Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you very much, everyone. And I'd like to shift the camera to Dr. Arnold Uson, our tech support. Thank you. Thank you, Noreen, and thank you for the moderator and, and Dr. Villegas. We like to thank everyone for uh, joining us on the third webinar series, as LMA says. Uh, we remind you again on October 17, 2020, we will have uncertainty upon uncertainty, a psychosocial support for cancer and COVID-19 healthcare providers. Hope you can join us again next week on Saturday at the same time here at CCI. Again, we'd like to thank the following sponsors. OEP Philippines Incorporated. Galing at Kalingang Mundi Pharma. Bio Onco Incorporated, the oncology subsidiary of United Laboratories. Santos Novartis Division. And Good Fellow Pharma. For our gold sponsors, we thank Calve International. And for bronze sponsors, Amber, a subsidiary of Rotero, Exxon, and Cyprus. Special thanks.